it in just a little bit. Um, stand by. Good evening, and thank you for joining today's ASEAN Talk. Please note that this session will be held in English, but Arabic interpretation is available. Therefore, for our audience on Zoom, you can choose your preferred language by clicking on the interpretation icon on the bottom of your Zoom window and selecting either the English or Arabic channel. You will also get a chance to participate in a Q&A session. So please turn your cameras on and get your questions ready. If you are watching this on YouTube, this session is only available in English. And now, join me in welcoming your moderator, Kareem Kamen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ajial Film Festival. Um, welcome to Ajial Talks. Um, my name is Kareem, as Yasmin mentioned. And I'm really excited today. And I'm really excited about the fact that Ajial allows me the opportunity to discover. So it's not just you guys, it's me as well. So I'm a little bit selfish that way. And speaking of selfish, one of, honestly, one of my personal heroes, uh, someone who really has inspired me over the past few months is here with us today. And I'm really excited to introduce that person to you. Uh, before she comes to the stage, we're gonna play a really short video to, to show you guys what it is that um, Alexi Pappas does. <laughs> I looked, maybe, like a very strong princess. The misconception that people might have when they look at the things that I've done on paper or in any given year is that I'm doing them all at the same time. She is an Olympic athlete. She competed in Rio. She's also a poet, a writer, a filmmaker. She co-wrote, co-directed, and starred in two feature films. Uh, and she's also an author. I'm trying to do one of those things really well in any given moment and then excellently transition to the next task. <laughs> what it takes to put a movie together is so different than what it takes to just keep running when you're in a mile repeat. All right, I want you to give a big Agile welcome to Alexi Pappas, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How do you select a chair when there are two in front of you? You just make a choice and you say, this was my choice that I will make. Okay, I am so happy to be here with you all and I am a thoughtful person as we all are and so I wrote something that I will share with you. Okay, so as we know, I am Alexi Pappas. You may or may not know, I'm an Olympic runner. I ran the 10K in Rio the longest event on the track, and I have made a few movies, and one of them called Tall as the Baobab Tree actually played at the Doha Film Festival. And my first advice for you all is that if you need to skip class to go to a film festival for a movie you made, you should do it, because I didn't skip class, and now this is my first time here. So it's okay if you need to do that um, for a movie you made. Okay, and most recently I published a memoir called Bravey with a Ford by Maya Rudolph, who's a mentor of mine. And um, that book, uh, I think, was the proudest, one of the proudest things I've ever done. Okay, so when I was invited to come here, I leapt at the opportunity because not only had I never been here and wanted to come, but I also seek every opportunity that I can to be around greatness. And I believe that you are all just full of greatness. And so just being in a room with you all, whether right here or virtually, we are surrounded by greatness. And there's something about that that just rubs off on each other. And so I just wanted to say that regardless of all the life-changing advice I'm about to give you, just by being in a room together, 
we are affecting one another. And I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to be here with me and letting me share this with you. All right. Okay. Now, however, even when I hadn't been able to be in a room with people I admire, because I've lived in mountain towns, super secluded. I grew up without a mom, which to me felt like I was missing like the person that I wanted to be around most in the world. She passed away when I was four. I needed to be around greatness and mentors and good energy regardless. And so I started to adopt this philosophy of almost like a mentor buffet. Like, okay, I can't have this one keystone person, but I get to have everybody else. And I started to listen to audiobooks, to podcasts, watching movies, and just pretending, reading books, whatever it is, pretending that those people were speaking directly to me. And I used my imagination, and I felt that that was my right. I think it's our right to use our imaginations to our favor. And I just pretended like I had that that energy perfume, those people around me, even when I wasn't in the same room as them. And so now I will speak directly to you um, and share the best three lessons, I think there's a few more in there, that I've learned about <laughs> dream chasing. Okay, first, I believe that dream chasing is not a waste of time. And a lot of worried parents out there think it's a waste of time. I have experienced many a lecture about that. It is only a waste of time if you do it part way. And I think that's truly what gives dream chasing a bad reputation. And, you know, I, there are many people who will take the first few steps towards chasing a dream, but they will take the first hurdle, the first challenge as a reason why their dream was impossible. And I wanna ask you, ask us to shift right now for the rest of our lives that mindset. And when we hit those hurdles, Try to figure out why the universe was still in your favor. So let me give you an example. When I was training for the Olympics, I remember one day I like tripped over a rock and just fell on my face. And um, maybe a, a, an older me, a former me, a former me would have been like, okay, the world is against me. I fell down. My Olympic dream is impossible, whatever. But this new, this new optimistic side said, you know what? That rock meant that I was just supposed to slow down that day. So I just want to ask us, like, in chasing our dreams, it may sound simple, but any challenge that you have in your way, try to figure out a way why that was in your favor. And you may have to retroactively figure that out. But always be rewriting your narrative. Um, and and, and it, will, it will do great things for you. Okay. So for me, that choice to see the world as an abundant place really did come from losing my mom young, I, I, she took her own life. And that was like really, really challenging for me because I feel like my entry into the world was a world that took things from me. And so when I, when I tell you like we have a choice to see the world as abundant, I really mean it. And I really, really think that um, if, I had, if I had seen it any other way, none of the things that I created would have been possible, you know? And okay, so let's, Let's lighten up a little bit here. Um, so we know that dream chasing is not a waste of time. Now, how do we chase our dreams? Okay, I'm very specific about this because when I wanted to chase dreams, I was like, how? Tell me very specifically. Tell me the steps and I'll do them. I'm going to tell you the steps. So first, we accept that it is not a waste of time. It is only a waste of time if we do it part way. How do we do it all the way? The first step is to write down your goals. And that sounds super, super basic and simple, but have you done it? And if you haven't, can you please, can you please write it down? If you don't like writing, can you record it on your phone? If you don't like recording, can you just make sure that it has some sort of agency in the world, that, it, that it's starting to become inevitable? And this not only keeps us like accountable, but it starts to build inevitability. Before I bought my little, or got my little, I have a pug, a little dog, we, I had a name for her before she existed. And I think that's okay, because we started talking about Bernini, Bernini, Bernini. And then, sure enough, Bernini exists. And she's a little dumpling that I love. Um, so write down your goal, even if it is difficult uh, for you to admit that. And only admit it to your core team and people who you trust. 
your core team, it can be your family, it can be your friends. Um, but make sure you take care of who you share it with. Not everybody needs to know. It's only what is useful to you. Okay, so if you don't have a goal, let's talk about that. I feel that you all might have a goal, but if you don't, let's talk about it. Because if you don't have a goal, the world might give one to you. And the world loves to tell you what you need, right? It tells me all the time, like you need to, I don't know, all the things. And the way I want us to approach this um, is we don't want to be leaves in the world where the world affects us. Every breeze affects us. You know how leaves are just, they're leaves, fine. We also don't want to be rocks where we're not affected by anything the world is telling us. We want to feel that. I like to think about myself as a tree with firm roots in the ground, but I still have those leaves. I have a swaying branch. I can feel what's going on in the world and how it affects me. So I think if you need to visualize yourself as something, the tree mentality is really, it's a good one, okay? Okay, if you don't have a goal, or if you're figuring out, is this the goal I really wanna to commit to? I have a simple thing for you to do for yourself that I've done many times. I got this advice from a mentor that said, if you're making a big decision, pretend that that opportunity is taken away. It's just, it's gone. How do you feel? Do you feel relief? If you feel relief, then maybe that wasn't the thing for you, right? But if you feel like, no, no, then maybe that's the dream you need to be chasing. So if you guys have a big, if you have a big decision you're making, to me, that's helped me make big decisions. Could also help with, you know, a breakup decision, you know, other decisions in life. That's a good way to do it. Okay, so now we have our goal. Now, we need to commit for a period of time to chasing that goal without questioning the goal itself. Think about it like um, you are now a stew, you are a soup. Soups do not cook in five minutes, not a good soup anyway. So imagine that you are that soup and you must give yourself a period of time that you are committed to that dream. And barring any big red flags, like you don't get no injury, no, no, no big life-changing you know, barrier, we are committed for that period of time and we don't check in on the goal itself during that, that period of time. So it could be, hey, I'm committed to this goal for three months. And I know there's gonna be ups and downs on the way, but I don't question the goal itself. And I cannot tell you how important that is. Could be a year, could be just decide and commit to that, okay? Okay, all right. Um, next, just understand that the dream come true happens very, very slowly and then all at once. Most of our time will be in the very, very slowly phase. But the fun thing about that is that anybody, whether you get the dream, whatever it is or not, your pursuit of it is a part of getting that dream. So I just, I want you to feel like I actually am in the dream while I'm chasing it. And that's been a newer epiphany of mine. And some people say, enjoy the journey. And it never resonated with me. But when I was like, no, 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 you're in it while you're chasing it because you're doing the same steps that anybody who achieves or gets or doesn't, I started to feel really excited while I was in the very, very slowly period. Okay. Lesson two, willpower. I need to, I need to keep going. We, have, we don't have enough time, and I have so much I want to tell you. Okay, willpower. While you're chasing your dream, you might feel drained sometimes, and it has nothing to do with the amount of sleep you got. That is called willpower. It's like an intangible energy that you give whenever you make a small decision. Like, what am I going to wear today? What am I going to order for lunch? What, when am I going to step out the door? Those are all draining to willpower. And I want us to all accept now that willpower is a real and depletable resource. And that's why at the end of the day, you might cave and get some french fries when you didn't plan on that in the morning. Fine. Now, the key about willpower is understanding that what drains your willpower is different than what drains mine. So let's take the example of cooking, okay? I love cooking. To me, at the end of the day, if I've had a rough day, if I'm drained, cooking replenishes my willpower. For my best friend, it drains her willpower. She doesn't wanna cook, that's not her thing. And so the first thing to understand is it's gonna be unique to each of us and we don't, we don't, we can't, say what drains or replenishes somebody else's willpower. What we can do is understand our own and find ways to 
one, understand why at the end of the day, if we've done all willpower depleting activities, even if they're good for us. Like I find stationary biking to be very draining to my willpower, but it's good for my health, right? I need to add in things throughout the day that will replenish that willpower. So I think just understanding that will give you the longevity to get to that dream. So making sure that we eat, we have sleep, but also willpower. That's another resource we need. Um, and I didn't learn that until college, and I wish that I had known it sooner. All right. We are doing great. <laughs> so a few ways that you can, you know, save your willpower. I have this phrase, tomorrow starts tonight, and it's just try and take out some of the micro decisions you're going to make on your big days by doing things for yourself the night before. It could be as simple as laying out your clothes the night before, setting the coffee maker if you like coffee, um, deciding when you are going to step out the door so that all those little decisions don't drain yourself from being able to make the big decisions that you need to make every day, okay? So we can do that for ourselves. Um, and let's not judge ourselves, okay? The things that deplete your willpower are real. It would be like, why would you judge yourself if you hadn't eaten all day and you were hungry, or if you didn't sleep all night and you were tired? We will never judge ourselves again for having willpower depletion, ever. We're done. We will never do that. It's done. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So. Next lesson. This is the best advice I've ever gotten in my entire life. It, and, and, and it was so recent that I just can't wait to tell you. OK, so it's called the rule of thirds. So I guess it wasn't so recent. I was preparing for the Olympics, which were a few years ago. And I could not hit my splits, like my times, for a really hard workout. And I was very discouraged, because I was like, this must mean that I'm not ready. And my coach, who was an Olympian himself, he pulled me aside and he said, Nope, Lex, that is it's just the rule of thirds. And I was like, what, what is the rule of thirds? And he said, when you are chasing a dream or doing anything hard, you are supposed to feel good a third of the time, OK a third of the time, and not so great a third of the time. And if you feel roughly in those ratios, that's what doing something hard or chasing a dream is. Now, if I felt too good all the time, that ratio would be off. It would mean maybe I'm not pushing myself to a place where I would do this thing that no one had done before. But if I felt too not great or insert whatever word there for more than a third of the time, it might mean that I was fatiguing or otherwise drained or just it, it's not sustainable. And so this rule of thirds really changed my life. Because that day, I wasn't hitting my splits, but that was my not so great third. And that actually meant that I was on the path to chasing my dream. And in fact, I was. Like, I, I will tell you from experience that I ran the race of my life after that training. And so I, it, it was correct. And so with this rule of thirds, I want to bequest it to you all to use however you, you need it. Because I use it. When, I'm, when I was writing my book, I didn't feel great every single day. But I was like, that means I'm doing it. I'm in an OK day. When I'm in love, like love, that's a kind of dream, right? It's hard. It's hard. School, whatever it is that you guys are doing, the rule of thirds can apply. And I'm telling you, it will make that journey a lot more fun. And it will make this dream chasing thing make sense. Like to me, everything clicked. Um, and I hope that gives you some peace of mind while you chase those dreams. Oh, you don't have to clap. You guys are so good. OK, OK, OK. Um, and, I, and I encourage you to relish the not so great days. Like, I'm doing it. Today's the not so great day, OK? Um, all right. So I want to sort of start to wrap up by talking about being as kind to ourselves as we are hard on ourselves. Uh, which is a difficult thing. I think all of us are in this room because we are, you know, somehow driven, focused, present, seeking, adventuring, wanting, trying, believing, struggling, whatever it is. It is so hard to be proud of ourselves. Maybe not for you, but it was hard for me for a while. And I remember I had another coach who noticed 
that, so in, in, in my college that I went to, it was in New Hampshire, we, it was really cold there. We would run all the way to the locker room door and we would, that's where we'd finish practice, but we'd basically click our watches, shower, go to dinner, go to the library, go to the, and never stop and be proud of ourselves. We would just move through the world like robots. And he was like, what are you doing? So he drew a chalk line on the ground and, he, and it was about mm, like 100 meters from the, the locker room door. And he said, you're not allowed to run past this point. You need to walk and enjoy what you just did and enjoy your teammates. And to me, that was like, I needed that instruction to be like, nope, you can't run right now. You've got to walk. And I think that relishing, it's called relishing. It's what I do. I, I build it into my daily routine. I encourage you to incorporate some element of relishing into your dream chasing journey. So it could be while I sit and wait for my tea to cool, I am going to be relishing. While I'm laying in bed listening to this one song, I'm gonna relish. While I am in between this activity, build it in to a, a routine you already have and take that time to just be really fishing for pride for yourself. Really do it and that'll help build your willpower and um, it's, just, it's just important. And I want to wrap up by giving you some very, very specific advice on what to do when you have a bad day. Because they happen, OK? So my college roommate, her name was Becca. She lived with me. And she was an excellent athlete, amazing. But we all have bad days. And she would do this thing that I now do that I want to share with you all called New Day. What she would do is when her day was going south, she would on her pajamas at her house, climb into her bed, close her eyes for one minute, and then pop up and yell, new day! And then she would put on a different outfit, make breakfast and coffee, and just allow herself the generous gift of starting over. And I've heard her do it multiple times a day. <laughs> I've heard her do it at 5 p.m. And I now have that routine. Now, I don't always get into bed. Sometimes I'm literally on the go. But I allow myself the gift of saying new day and I think it's just something that I want to give to you if you want it. And you can do it any time, any day that you want. And it's a real thing. It's like, I guess all these lessons are really saying that a lot of dream chasing is about reframing a circumstance that seems objective and deciding to redefine it using actions and vocabulary. And New Day is just one of those examples um, but it's a really good one. So that's the, that's the last advice I want to give you. And I think, I don't even know what that paper says. I just want to say, just being with like a group of people who's curious or just listening is like a really, really big gift. And I want to give to you whatever I can. And so if any of this was useful, then use it. And if any of it was not useful, then just forget it. Because in life, there's going to be a lot of content coming your way. And I think just always take what's useful and stay on your own team. That's the most important thing with this dream chasing journey, is that you relentlessly decide that you will stay on your own team. All right, that's it. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the amazing advice, Alexi. Um, I want to start out the conversation by asking, uh, you're someone who obviously has a bunch of dreams going on at once. So how do you, how do you balance uh, several dreams and the, the several things that, that you work yeah. on? Yeah. OK, I'm always going to give really specific practical advice, which is that I, I always know, and we all are balancing a lot of things, but I always know what the priority is. So at any given moment, like in those intervals we talked about, understand for yourself what the priorities are. And those can shift, but when, you, when, I, when I know my priorities, I know what I need to answer to first. So when I was really, really seriously training for the Olympics, it was like I need to factor in practice and sleep before everything else. And the creative work needed to fit in between that. When I'm in production, the training needs to fit around production schedule. And so I think it's just, it's like, it's very simple, but it requires being more like a tree than a leaf, right? 
know what you're doing and what is important. But, <laughs> don't you clap. <laughs> Um, so the name of your book, uh, Bravey, yeah. can you tell us what a Bravey is or what Bravey is? Yes. Okay. Bravey uh, came from a poem that I wrote, which was run like a Bravey, sleep like a baby, dream like a crazy, replace can't with maybe. And the word Bravey, um, I think it stuck because like growing up, I, I, I mean, you, you know, I, I grew up without my mom, which like means a lot of things, but what it meant was that I like wanted to figure out what I was going to become. And I thought I was, I was chasing a lot of external facing words, like strong, pretty, things that you ultimately present to the world. And what Bravey felt like, because it wasn't a real word, even though it comes from a real word, it felt more inward facing and it felt like a choice that I could make. And I think that that's why it stuck, is that you can just choose to be that thing and decide what it means to you. And I would have liked to have a word like that when I was young and very confused. So it's now the jurors' time to ask some questions. We have some jurors here in the venue, and we're also joined by jurors all over the world, and they're tuning in from Zoom. Um, they're going to be coming in on that monitor over there, um, Alexi. So. I'm so when it's, excited. When it's time to meet them. Uh, we'll take a question from the venue first. And Abdurrahman, we got to go with you first, right? It's like, it's like a tradition, <laughs> right? Oh my God. Hi, so my name is Abdurrahman Mohi. I'm from Egypt. And um, I, re I really commend you on all of like, these life achievements. And I feel like it's so, like, I feel so happy just like listening to you talking about how uh, you perceive your own moments because I feel like sometimes we can be really hard on ourselves and and how we get here that we forget that we did a lot of good things and mm -hmm. and I'm just like really happy that I heard you talk about these things and I feel like there isn't enough talk about mental health and uh, being perceived as someone that um, uh, of, uh, of excellence and how people perceive you as like some sort of, like, you know, yeah. uh, thing more than a person, right? Yeah, like a superhero who can't mess up. Yes, and yeah. that's really important. And so my, my biggest question would be, like, um, how did it feel like um, entering two industries or spaces that are usually perceived as a men's club and mm. how, what are you doing now to make it more accessible to a more intersectional audience? Yeah, what a good question. Thank you. And your energy is so generous. Like the whole time I was like, I am getting some nice, like what a nice, what a, what a wonderful gift you are. So, okay, I, I think that the first time I really thought about this was as an athlete and I was training, I'm, I'm Greek American and I trained in Greece for like a month before Rio and I noticed that there were a lot of like young girls who looked like they could be my sisters and they were looking at me like I was like really crazy because I looked very strong, like I was very chiseled and all those things and um, someone came up to me, a little girl at the track, and her brother, her brother was playing soccer and football in the, in the middle. And she asked why I was running and why I looked how I looked. And I spoke, I speak enough Greek to have communicated that I'm an athlete and that she could be that too one day. And I think that what it showed me is that it's not, I think I'm gonna be able to show people more than I'm gonna be able to tell people what they could be. And so, I think what I've tried to do is just like be in spaces and exist and do the best I can to make eye contact and connect with people so that maybe they can see themselves in it too. And I think that's where I can make the most impact and that's, that's what I've tried to do. Um, and I think that's what we can do is just do our best to be in those spaces that we can be and then open the doors for other people to, to come as well. So that's, that's right now what I'm doing. And, and I tried to, I think also with the book, like a book is like, it's not a diary, it's like a memoir and you hope it will communicate. 
And so I think I tried to talk about some circumstances in there that were a little tough for me where I was treated strangely, um, but within, with all backed by like action because I don't want to just complain. I want to like have an answer to it. Front row in the middle over here. So oh, hello, my name is Zareem, I'm from Qatar, and I just want to say your talk today has been ins really inspiring, incredible, you have such a contagious, fun, cute energy, and I just loved it. So one point, <laughs> one thing you mentioned was during your dream chasing, yeah. is to tell your goals to people that you trust or your uh, core people. Yes. So, and one aspect of that core people could be family. For people who have families that aren't necessarily as supportive of their goals, yeah. what could they do in that situation? Thank you. Yes. What a good question. Okay, so um, I think that the first thing is finding, like maybe even before addressing family, finding core team that makes you feel, makes us feel um, stable enough to take the next step with our dreams. So I think it's like find the core team even if they are not your family. But what, I, what I'm hearing is that it might be challenging because family, you need your family on board. And I think that that may or may not always be the case. And the best we can do um, is try to help them understand that the commitment that we have to our dream is as full as anyone chasing a more traditional career or a career or, or a dream that may be more pre-approved by parents. And I've certainly, to be honest, been told, like, I remember, I don't know why I remember this, probably because it hurt my feelings, but it was like one of my best friend's dad was like, why are you running and making movies like you should be saving the planet? Oh, you know what I'll tell you? Because I heard this advice after, I didn't know what to say to him. I was like, I think I'm doing good in the world, but I don't know. Okay, there was a speaker that came to Dartmouth and he said a bunch of different advice, but he, all, he did say, as long as you're not hurting anybody, if you are manifesting the greatest version of yourself, like if you're chasing your dream, you are doing good in the world. And I think hopefully that's something that like maybe our parents need to hear or whatever. But I felt like I needed to hear it because at times I felt a little weird and selfish being an athlete or being an artist. And that just like did away with it all because I was like, oh, I'm not hurting anybody and this does feel like a manifestation of myself. And so um, I would hope that would help. But I, but I think we can't convince anybody of anything so it's just about creating a safe space where you're still allowed to pursue your dream. So I think that's honestly the answer, where it's like they may never fully, until the New York Times starts a big piece about, you know what I mean? Like they may never, but you just need enough space to be able to chase that dream. And I hope that you or whoever this fictitious person is gets that space. All right, so we're gonna go to Zoom now for the first time. I'm like and pointing as if I have any control over this. <laughs> Alexi, and we're gonna talk to that camera over there. This right. one? Yeah, that one. Okay. Hello, I'm Alexi. Hi. I'm Hassan from Yemen. Uh, uh, for me, whenever I start to chase my dreams or the things that I want to uh, achieve, I start to get away from social media because it's a source of distraction for, for me. My question for you is, what is the impact of social media uh, in your career, in your, in your life, like while you are chasing your dreams? What's the impact of social media? What an amazing comment and question. Okay, I feel the same way as you, where social media can really stress me out. And so it's a part of my job to do social media. Like it's literally written into some of my athletic contracts and so like I have to be doing it but I want to just say that what I generally do is follow this guiding light of do what's useful for me so um, there are often times where I'll minimally engage if that feels useful or I'll really lean in if it feels useful to me and I think that um, if if you feel something like stress or energize whatever you feel that is the emotion you feel. And I, and I wanna encourage you to not have the secondary judgment. That's when we like judge our emotions. So if it's like, I feel overwhelmed, but I should feel 
happy, to forget the secondary judgment. And um, I just, I try to use social media insofar as it's useful. And that is really important because when I was your age, I don't even think there was social media and I, and I think it would have been really hard if there was because there's so much noise out there, right? Social media makes us leave, don't, doesn't it? And that can be a good thing if you're like in a party mood, but like maybe you don't want to be a leaf. So I hope that helps. And just for me to say that I feel the same way as you, and I'm, I really mean that. So we're going to go back to the venue. Hands real high. Highest hand gets the question. You all the way in the back over there. Yeah. So please say your name, where you're from, how old you are. Um, hi, I'm Hanan. I'm from India. I'm 16 years old. Um, you were talking about the one-third ratio. Um, when exactly did you feel like that uh, the advice that your coach had given really started to um, advantage in your life? Yeah, honestly, that day, because I had a really rough day, and I was like, what do I think about myself, and how do I sleep at night because I'm so stressed? And he was like, today is your not so great one third. And so I think with the one thirds, take it now and, and just mm, always use it. And it, it, helps, it helps me with everything. So I think um, it took f effect immediately and it has not lost its potency. <laughs> How about over here? Let's show this side of the room some love. Your name, how old you are, Hello, where you're from. Lexi. Um, my name is Zain. I'm from Pakistan. I'm 18 years old. It's a real pleasure talking to you. I wanted to ask you, we, we all get involved in activities of our choice, but one issue that most of us face is that we jump to conclusions that where will we be in the future or how successful we'll be. So yeah. I wanted to ask you, what would Alexei Papas do to prevent that? Yes. Okay. So you're basically talking about like the fear of like, what will I be in five years or 10 years or that sort of thing? Yes. Oh, I have the answer for you. I have, I have the answer for you. So I think the best thing to know is that if we thought too far in advance, so this actually comes back to those windows of time. So part of the window of time that we build in is so that we don't quit too early, right? Like we need to like buckle down for three months or a year. But the other thing is that we don't wanna plan those windows of time to be five or 10 year windows because you will probably outgrow yourself, outgrow your expectations, and smash the ceiling that you thought that you had. And so if you worried about five years from now or made decisions about it, you would probably limit yourself. So the specific example I'll give you is when I was a freshman in college, I was 19, 18, your age. I never thought that I would go to the Olympics. I was the worst on my team, like the worst. I didn't think about the Olympics. It wasn't on my mind. But if I thought this is where I need to be in five years, I would have been like, that's impossible. Take it off the plate. Do not think about the Olympics. But I only thought about a year in advance. And I still do that, OK? So I don't, I literally do not know where I'll be more than a year from now. And that's partly because I know that I will far exceed my own expectations. And I hope that helps you to not only not worry about five or 10 years from now, but know that even if you did, it wouldn't help you. You can help yourself the most by keeping those windows like this far, not like that far. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help? Thank you. Does that help? Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna go back to Zoom, Alexi. Oh, so. yay, Zoom. <laughs> Hi, I'm Fatima from Pakistan, and uh, my question is very personal. Uh, which is it? Which beliefs do you carry, which are pushing you forward? Can you repeat that? Uh, which beliefs do you carry which are pushing you forward? What beliefs do I carry that are pushing me forward? Yep. I believe that the world and the universe is an abundant place and that we all belong in it. I believe that I matter simply by existing and that wasn't something that I used to believe um, because I used to feel like I didn't matter because my mom left, but now I know that I do matter. And most recently, I believe that my instincts are more correct and okay 
and right than I used to think. So I hope that helps. I'm going to go to you in the back because you've been holding your hand up since the very beginning. Hi, my name is Lafan. Um, I know I don't know you personally, but I do want to say I'm so proud of you as like a human being. And I'm proud of everyone here, because you started this whole thing with saying we're all great. So to the team, to the people sat down, and to you as well, everyone, like we're all proud of you, and we're keep doing you. So, so that's number one. Um, so the thing is, is that you radi radiate a lot of optimism, and I consider myself an optimist. But when it comes to optimism, you have a lot of um, stereotypes or connotations that show the side that's like, oh, if you're an optimist, you're unrealistic. Right. Or for example, like, oh, it's so much easier to be a pessimist than it is an optimist. So these are the general stereotypes that are always circulating around. Yeah. My question is, do you believe in these stereotypes? So do you think it's harder to be an optimist than a pessimist? Or do you think, for example, that optimism is something that's unrealistic? I'm probably sure that you're gonna say no. Um, so that's one. And then two is just about people. So we surround ourselves with people all the time and we're influenced by them. So if we are surrounded by, let's say, pessimistic people, it sometimes does weigh us down. Yeah. But what is the perfect balance of making sure that you're, let's say, there for someone, but you're not also getting pulled down as well? Oh, these are great questions. <laughs> All right, so with the optimist thing, I think the word optimist is sort of, um, it feels a little bit like a cloud where like you couldn't quite like ca capture a cloud or like if you try, it, Optimist feels like trying to pinch a cloud with tweezers, where it's like, I, I don't know what that means. And that's why a lot of what I've talked to you about today was about rooting ourselves in really specific actions and creating inevitability. So it's, I think to simply, I think optimism is like an overarching umbrella, but it gets a bad name, right? Like just like dream chasing. And I think I see myself as like a scrappy, relentless, inevitable, inevitability creature, rather than an optimist because I think I'm very specific about my actions. I think I'm very intentional about where, what I'm doing and when. And I think um, that I believe that everything is possible um, because I'm doing the actions that it takes. And so, yes, stay an optimist who uh, is plugged in and does the things we talked about today, you know? Like, and I'm just giving you advice as if like you were my teammate, where it's like, yeah, be optimistic, but, but be optimistic rooted in reality, you know, which we are. And our reality is that we, we can get the things that we want. And as far as the people, so people do have that energy, right? And, and I remember there was, in college, I, would, I was really like spread out and like a lot of people wanted my time and that's okay, that's a really big privilege but I was told some advice um, that was to be, be thoughtful about how many people I was spending time around where I was also getting something out of that friendship or whatever it was, and to know that too much of it being one-sided will drain my willpower. And so I think what it comes down to is people, no, no people, negative people, or you know that stuff will just drain your willpower, and so when you're taking stock of where your willpower is, just make sure that if you're giving time to some energy like that, maybe, maybe don't at all, but if you do, make sure it's balanced out and that it's reasonable because you need that willpower. Um, so yeah, saying no is hard, but people are gonna be okay. You're important. <laughs> I hope that helps. Yeah, you in the middle. You were, you were so surprised when I picked you. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Ward. Uh I'm from Syria. Uh, I have actually two questions, if that's fine. One is, uh, what was your biggest like dream that you've achieved, and how relieved were you that this big thing that you never anticipated that you would achieve finally happened? And uh, my second question is, uh, your pug, Bernini. Yes. How old is she, and is she a rescue? How old is she, and? Is she a rescue? Okay, so Bernini is two and a half, and she's not a rescue. She came from a family that had a litter prior from our neighboring town, and so we, we f found her in our town, and she is amazing. 
Um, she makes, she's like a jester, like a, like she makes me laugh when I'm being too serious. That's how I enjoy having a dog, is just someone to make me giggle. <laughs> um, okay, and then for your question about the dream. Okay, so, uh, so I would say the Olympic dream was like the biggest one, and um, I wasn't actually relieved after it happened. And this is something I wanna share with you all, because I think it does relate to mental health, that if we're chasing like a really, um, uh, an external dream, like an objective, a thing that you accomplish. I think so often we assign it some sort of value where we assume it's going to fix some intangible problem that we have. Like for me, if I'm being honest, I felt like my misunderstanding about, you know, the way that my mom left meant that I didn't matter, which I kind of mentioned before, and that I wanted to really, really, really matter and so I wanted to be an Olympian. And when I got it, I was super happy. Like it was the best time of my life. It was so great. But it didn't fix that problem, that void that I felt. And what I, what I faced after that was this like kind of post-Olympic dip that a lot of Olympians have. And I think it's, um, it's natural. But what I wanted to say is basically have big dreams, like have them and chase them, but know that anything that's going on inside that we are struggling with will not just be magically fixed by an external dream. And it doesn't mean don't chase the dream. It just means go into it knowing that, that you, you know, can be whole with or without it. And that's the most important thing. So I loved it. I loved being, I love it, but I also needed to learn that it wasn't just going to like tick a box like that, you know? We're gonna go back to Zoom, but I'm coming back to you afterwards, okay? Hi, so my name is Kenzie, I'm from Egypt. So my question is, uh, what keeps you motivated to chase your dreams? Like, what is one thing that keeps you motivated? I, the thing that keeps me motivated I was gonna be like, I really like good food and travel. Like, I, you know, something really simple. But um, I think when I'm in, in a moment that's really hard, I use this word, stay, just stay. And that like in the middle of a really hard race or in the middle of a really hard moment, stay really calms me down. So that word has really helped me. Um, but I think that building in those, those intervals of time to chase your dream, helps address the motivation challenge because you know that you made a decision at the beginning to be committed for the interval of time that you selected, right? So that you, you were saying, I'm here for three months and then I can check in. And then in the middle of that, you know that a yesterday you committed and that a tomorrow you will reconsider and recalibrate if you need to. So I think the motivation comes from the calmness and the composure, knowing that you had made that decision to be in your dream chasing. And, and that's helped me a lot. Because it's not, I think motivation can't be this thing that we like, like zap ourselves with. Like that doesn't feel super sustainable. It needs to be like a, like a smoother thing, right? Like that's how I feel like motivation should be. Occasionally it should be like this. But most of the time it should be like this. I hope that helps. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Amr. I'm 14. Really love your talk. This was amazing. Um, my question's about uh, dreams. If they're amazing. Sometimes you need help to achieve them. So how do you get help when you need it? Yeah. Do you have a specific like type of help that you're looking for? Or do you just want me to address it generally? You can generally. be just generally? generally. Okay. Okay. So when, once you commit to the dream that you have, we skipped a few steps that I will mention now, which is you need to know or start to gather what are the specific things that I need to achieve that goal, whatever. And you may not even know what they are, and that's where you might ask for help. You might be like, how do I even do this? And to that, I say, 
feel empowered to ask for help from mostly people who are more experienced than you. And I think I became pretty shameless about asking for help. And the worst that someone could say is like, no, or like, I don't have time for you. And it's like, fine. If you get, even if you got nine no's and one yes, that's enough. And so I think just being okay, asking for help and knowing that a lot of the information will come from other people or from outside of yourself. Um, and is there like, is that, is that answering your question or is there something like, does it make you, is it hard for you to ask for help or is it like, sometimes it's hard to ask for help? Yeah, it is hard. I find it hard too sometimes. And the way you could ask for help is to prepare to ask for help. So if you are writing it, you can have somebody else look at the email that you write and that might make you feel better. Like I have a, I have a partner and he will often look at the email and he'll be like, yeah, that's great. Or he'll change a few words. Like if you have a teammate, if you can find a friend, that can help. If you're gonna have a phone call, um, I think the best approach is to be interesting, which you are, I can tell, and interested in them. So you, you like know who you're, you know a little bit about this person you're asking for help from. Um, and also to know that it's very flattering to people when you ask them for help, because it means you admire them. And so you can also tell them that you admire them. And um, yeah, I think as far as the nervousness thing, it's like, just take the step and see what happens, you know? It'll get, it's like a muscle. It'll get stronger and stronger. Your ability to ask will help. That's what it is, it's a muscle. So yeah, at first you're like, Ugh. And then eventually you'll be like, yep, I can do this. Yeah. So we have one last question, sadly. Um, and it's gonna, going to come from Zoom. Hi. And uh, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Rabia Jan. I'm from Syria. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the importance of having uh, films or books uh, that talks about uh, sports or uh, Olympics uh, sports? Why is it and important? Thanks. Well, I think it's important because some people... Sorry? Okay, I'm going to speak. Okay, it's important because some people like my father don't know how to talk about things like falling down and getting back up or challenges in any other way besides sports. And that was just the way my dad was. And that's how he taught me how to fall down and get back up, how to be on teams, how to have a goal that is not like ultimately life or death, but I was going to commit to it as if it mattered that much. And, and I think to write a book or make a movie about it um, is can show people those same things uh, in the same way that I learned them. And as filmmakers, as filmmakers, as storytellers, they always say, like, just tell your own story or speak from a place of truth. But why is that? It's because it's more specific. And the more specific we are, the more broadly relatable it's going to be. And so for me, I am an athlete. And so to tell stories in that world was the best way for me to communicate. Um, and I think that there aren't as many athletic storytellers. And so I gladly stepped up to the plate. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for being Thank here. Thank you. Me. Oh my gosh. I, Are we going to get our team picture now? <laughs> yeah, actually, I have, we're going to try to arrange a team picture if everybody could come up here in just a little bit. But before we do that, please give it up for Alexi. Oh, thank you. That was incredible. <laughs> thank you for tuning in, jurors at home. Thank you for tuning in to SGL Talks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Aww, thank you, guys. Team pick? Thank you.